Thank you. Um, I hope I will I will uh, add to that cluster. But on the other hand, what I what I am going to say is slightly slightly different. I think. So the recent focus, both institutionally, politically, and philosophically, on interdisciplinary collaboration in the case of mathematization, may offer a nuance of perspective. For centuries, mathematicians have applied their discipline and their craft to various sciences, and yet such mathematization is rarely described as interdisciplinary. And although almost a bit here is in modern science, the notion of mathematization itself uh, is loaded with ambiguity. Mathematization shares commonalities with applied mathematics, yet it encompasses more than a body of knowledge. It's a process undertaken by disciplinary mathematicians and scientists who share in a collaborative culture. This paper springs from currently ongoing research and is part of a collaborative project with colleagues in Aarhus and elsewhere. Uh, but whereas the larger project is devoted to philosophical questions of interdisciplinary explanations, especially in collaborations that involve mathematics, my focus here today is perhaps more historical. I want to argue indirectly for the usefulness of an approach through what I call conscious of mathematization. So that will, that will be important. My background ambition with this paper has been to ask a basic, reflexive and yet rather simple question, namely what happens to some of the most interesting discussions about this interdisciplinarity, for instance about explanations and expertise, when cases are considered where mathematics is involved. Naively, and at least on some accounts of interdisciplinarity, the use of mathematics in other fields ought to be the primary example of cross-disciplinary research. So why isn't it that the first example to come to mind or be treated by my colleagues. I cannot possibly hope to answer these broad questions today, so instead I want to outline what I consider a promising avenue for investigating this, these questions and discuss a few historical and recent examples. So this paper therefore falls in, in three parts. In my first part, I want to show that something interesting needs to be said about the, very, the way mathematics enters into the interdisciplinary collaborations in the sciences. In the second part, I provide some historical examples of theoretical and mathematical modeling involving values of explanation, that's where the connection to values will come in, from which, in the third part, I draw my philosophical and historical analysis. So let me begin. In a recent paper, my colleagues Hannah Andersen and Susan Wagenknecht have discussed the epistemic dependence within interdisciplinary groups. Their focus has been on analyzing the potential tensions, even conflicts within research groups, that span what they call complementary background, background knowledge. And as a starting point, they take the central elucidation of what they call multilateral epistemic dependence offered by uh, Hartwig. And you can say, let's see there. And I quote, it is the testimony of one scientist or mathematician to another that connects the bit of evidence gathered by different researchers into a unified whole that can justify conclusion. By accepting each other's testimony, individual researchers are, uni are united into a team that may have what no individual member of the team has, sufficient evidence to justify the mutual conclusion. So emphasis here is on the internal epistemic dynamics within the group and the question of ascribing knowledge. My focus today is a related but yet slightly different one, and in keeping with the theme of mathematical cultures that Brendan has, has uh, set for these conferences, I want to address the different background, you could almost call them disciplinary, I would like to call them epistemic cultures, and I aim to use the values of explanation as a probe into these different cultures of mathematization. So I'm therefore interested in a specific subset uh, of interfield collaborations, namely those characterized by four criteria that I stipulated. So first, the collaboration must involve mathematics and mathematicians. And these categories are defined partly by the disciplinary structure and partly by the notion of mathematical expertise appropriate to the case in hand. To draw out the conclusions, it's desirable that the disciplinary backgrounds are as distinct from each other as possible, as this allows for a better focus on the epistemic division of labor that I want to address. Second, the involvement of mathematics must go beyond that of a mere tool. In particular, the collaboration must offer for me to be really interested in this context, the collaboration must offer rose to new mathematical insights, emphasis on the mathematical. Third, the collaboration should aim for understanding and explanation, since I want to use these as probes 
and therefore certain kinds of numerical and computational modeling are not so obvious candidates. But instead, I want to focus on cases where theoretical mathematical models play an essential role, and I'll elaborate on, on this in a second. So the relations between mathematics and the sciences have been philosophically contested topic for centuries, as you are, of course, aware. The discipline of mathematics itself shares a marked development in attitudes from the notion of mixed mathematics. Jose mentioned the workshop at Oberholfer, from mixed mathematics over applied mathematics to mathematical modeling and mathematization. In a sense, what I'm proposing here is a nuanced, contemporary view of mathematics, both pure and applied, as entering into a more genuine dialogue with all branches of science, such that knowledge, and in particular understanding and explanation, is produced in multiple disciplines, including pure mathematics. This will serve as my definition of what I want to call mathematization in the sciences, and as such is relatively recent phenomenon. The new mathematization served as a, in the development of quantum physics, of course, but it took particular hold as a phenomenon and as a term only around 1980. So these additional uh, reflections offer me a sobering perspective on the epistemic division of labor as it pertains to mathematics. In a slogan, I can summarize this condition as a restriction of my part two above, saying that now some of the added mathematical insights must belong to mainstream pure mathematics. That's the, that's the field I'm, I'm interested in. But in order to integrate these threads into, into a synthesis that can enable our understanding of what I want to call cultures of mathematization, I wish to introduce two further, link, two further ideas linking notions from recent science and technology uh, studies and scholarship. First, that of mathematical models as boundary objects, bridging different trading zones in the sense of Gallison, and second, that of epistemic cultures defined by Gnosetina as amalgams of arrangements and mechanisms bonded through affinity, necessity, and historical coincidence, which in a given field make up how we know what we know. So in his seminal book, Gallison explored the notion of boundary objects in relation to the construction of physical apparatus and technology, but it can quite easily be applied to mathematical models, I think. These two can function as the boundary objects that enable communication between different groups with different backgrounds, interests, and disciplinary matrices, for instance, in the sciences or in industry. A dominant view of mathematical modeling sees it as an iterative process, figure on your right, where the first steps consist in, in that a segment of reality is delineated, simplified, structured, and abstracted into a verbal model. This verbal model is then in the next step further abstracted and represented into a mathematical description from which mathematical consequences can be deduced, typically in the form of one or more equations that link the parameters to the modeled outcome. These mathematical consequences are then interpreted into a verbal model which can subsequently be used to make decisions or, de or conduct theory control against reality. Thus this presentation, short as this, of mathematical modeling features an intrinsic verbal level which can be adapted as a pitching description of the mathematical model itself for various audiences, so therefore opening up as a, as a boundary object. On the other hand, I want to specify Nocentina's essentially <coughs> anthropological definition into what I want to call cultures of mathematization, which include those amalgams that constitute how mathematical modeling is conducted, again bonded through affinity, necessity, and historical coincidence. I am a historian, of course. In particular, I think this will help focus our attention on the various attitudes and values towards the mathematical model and towards model assessment and critique of which explanations are a specific aspect. Thus, when different cultures of mathematization critically review their boundary objects of mathematical models, they may look to different arrows in the modeling process that I have outlined. Some will criticize the assumptions, others the idealization, yet others the mathematical apparatus and its application, and some will focus on the interpretations back into reality. Yet most or all of these aspects can coexist as cultures sharing the same boundary object, and hence the importance of the notion of culture for what I want to do. So in order to situate my framework and show some of its facets, I wish to first briefly contrast it by two cases from the history of applied mathematics or history of mathematics. Obviously many other cases could have been chosen. But the first one, I wish to discuss a well-known and often recited and appropriated case, that of the discussion about the age of the earth during the 19th century. Steeped in controversy about religion, about Darwinism, about disciplinary prestige and personal standing, 
The case is frequently used to illustrate a variety of points from the history of science. Let me recount some of the major ones for the present context. First, the background of the discussion was part of a revolt against biblical doctrine which set the, which, which set the age of the earth at around 6,000 6, years. At the second, at the head of the new scientific dating of the earth was William Thomson, later Lord Kelvin, who in 1862 applied Fourier's heat equation to his hypothesis about the interior of the planet to derive an estimate of the age of the earth at somewhere between 20 million and 400 million years. Kel third, Kelvin's estimate was widely accepted but also opposed by some geophysicists and geologists, including John Perry and T. Mellard Reed, whom I'll return to in a second. Historians have argued that the acceptance of Kelvin's model was due to his high social standing in British science, but I wish to argue that there were actually intrinsic values to his modeling that it was based on Fourier analysis of heat and that it was convertible or transferable to other domains as well. Such intrinsic values to his model, which although they were wrong, or the model was wrong, made it relevant to consider. In particular, such an appreciation can include the role of explanations in mathematical models. And for the criticism, that's point four, point four, a former assistant of Thompson, John Perry, presented his own estimate of somewhere between two and three billion years in 1895, and he prefixed his presentation or publication of it with a commentary on Thompson's methodology and the status of his modeling. Quote, I have usually said that it is a hope it, that it is hopeless to expect that Lord Kelvin should have made an error in calculation. So Perry's criticism was, not, not, was thus not aimed at the inner workings of Thomson's model or at his calculations, but rather at the assumptions upon which it was built. Kelvin, or Perry continued, uh, long quote, I like, I like it so much, so he says, I dislike very much to consider any quantitative aspects set by a geologist. I never till about three weeks ago seriously considered the problem of the cooling of the earth except as a mere mathematical problem as to which definite conditions were given. So it's not a problem of, the, the, the problem is situated for him not as a geological one but as a mathematical one. And a somewhat similar stance was taken already in 1878 by Mellard Reed, who in his article entitled The Age of the World as viewed by the geologist and the mathematician concluded that facts are safer than theories and his own position was well summarized in a footnote where he emphasized the hypothetical status of, of uh, Kelvin's assumptions and stressed that, quote, we cannot safely uh, reason on conjectures. So in summary, the modeling of the cooling of the Earth and the estimation of the Earth, of the age of the Earth, was not really any kind of interdis interdisciplinary collaboration, yet it points to an interesting tension between, uh, not a, any kind of interdisciplinary collaboration, it is much, uh, it is much <coughs> as various models were presented and criticized by individuals. Yet it points to an interesting tension between different cultures of mathematization at this intersection between physics and classical geology. Thompson had applied a version of mathematization akin to physical and mechanical models, had reduced the phenomenon to a simple diffusion equation, and had even conjectured about other conditions based on the strength and generality of its model. Opposed to this, both Reed and Perry presented criticism of Thomson's assumptions, noticeably not of his deductions of the mathematical apparatus or partial differential equations for studying heat diffusion. <coughs> Yet they did so expressing two distinct, distinct views on the role of models in geology. The trained geologist Reed was, was strictly opposed to mathematical models, which he called theories, and preferred the rigor of facts, whereas Perry who had a strong mathematics background and was soon to become involved with reforms in mathematics education in this country, viewed mathematical models favorably, but found geologists too vague and sloppy to draw interesting results from such models. This brings me to my second preliminary example, which is drawn from the prehistory of what is called mathematical biophysics. During one of the first meetings at Cold Spring Harbor, the Russian-born theoretical physicist Nikolai Slavshevsky proposed a mathematical model to account for spontaneous cell division, which, it, we, which he had been working on for some years. Rashevsky's original inspiration derived from viewing this colloidal solution as, quote, thermodynamically similar to solutions with molecules of various kinds. This opened for an analogy to exploit in modeling the process of cell division 
and estimating the critical size at which a living cell would spontaneously divide. Rashevsky's model was met with severe criticism from the biologists, <coughs> which ran, ran along the following lines. First, Rashevsky's idealizations were too crude. In particular, Rashevsky had ignored the, ignored the elasticity of the membrane, and no actual cell would be anything like a perfect sphere as he had conjectured or had uh, assumed. In response to these criticisms, Rashevsky argued that the reduction to simple mathematical cases, like the sphere, was standard practice within other fields such as physics, but this did not convince the biologists. They were fundamentally opposed to the reduction of biology to physics and to mathematics, which Rashevsky argued. Moreover, the biologists argued that Rashevsky's conclusion rested only on theory without any empirical underpinning or any suggestions of how they could be experimentally verified. As one biologist was to have told Rashevsky, A, nobody knew how biological cells divided, and moreover, B, nobody could know how biological cells divided, because this was biology after all. Thus, the case of Rashevsky's modeling of cell division features many of the same aspects as the previous case. However, whereas the use of mathematical models in geology would eventually become standard, Rashevsky spearheaded a new subdiscipline of, a new subdiscipline of mathematical biophysics, which institutionalized with its own journals and chairs and its own research agenda. As Tara Abraham has described it, Rashevsky's use of mathematics was not to address the quantitative aspect of a problem, but rather form the core of his methodology. So these two examples thus illustrate that the notion of cultures of mathematization can capture important aspects of the disciplinary complex and the formation of new interdisciplinary fields. Importantly, the cases are not merely disciplinary controversies, they point to central methodological and epistemic differences in the view of mathematical modeling for the benefit of geology and biology, respectively. As such, viewing the mathematical model as a boundary object that can be appropriated and criticized not only nuances the discussions about the conflict, but also point to what the resolution and the formation of new interdisciplinary fields focused on a more focused on the specific culture of mathematization. However, in both the cases discussed so far, the mathematics that went into the modeling has been previously established in other fields of mathematical modeling, in particular as basic principles in physics. So in keeping with the emphasized second criterion of, uh, I've mentioned above, the main case I'll touch now will address what happens when the mathematical apparatus and even the conceptual framework is not available on the shelves, but has to be designed anew. So the history of quartzite crystals, which I want to, to turn to now, could read like a standard disciplinary story. It can even be cast to illustrate some important Kuhnian issues. However, as I hope to show, based on the ongoing efforts to, mathem to mathematize quartzite crystals, something more intriguing is going on which points to the existence of a number of collaborative cultures with overlapping notions of explanation hinged on the centrality of a mathematical model as a boundary object. Since the first decades of the 19th century and until three decades ago, the mathematical treatment of lattices and their application to crystallography had been quite firmly established. In an infinite lattice with translation and rotation symmetries, only certain rotation symmetries are allowed. In particular, the rotations of order 5 are excluded by a simple mathematical argument referred to as the crystallographic restriction. However, all this firmly established paradigmatic knowledge was brought into question and eventually overturned when in 1982 the Israeli materialist, material scientist Dan Schettmann discovered a crystal structure whose diffraction spectroscopy revealed the hitherto forbidden tenfold rotational symmetry. Schettmann's discovery was announced in 1984 and was met with severe criticism and resistance, for instance by Linus Pauling, who was, who was infamous for noticing that there's no, quote, there's no such thing as quasi crystals, only quasi scientists. <laughs> Eventually, Schettmann would, after Pauling had died, Schettmann would be awarded with a Nobel Prize for chemistry in 2011. Thus, faced with an empirical refutation of an old and established mathematical model, without any viable alternative, the mathematical and crystallographic milieu had to revise and redefine their methods and concepts. This process led to an instrumental definition, redefinition of the very concept of a crystal, new mathematical investigations and ideas into symmetry, symmetry at large and apriorite tiling patterns, and the revival of a piece of mathematics hitherto mainly considered for its aesthetic beauties, that was the Escher drawing that I showed you at the start of Penrose times. It led to a multitude of interrelated interdisciplinary research questions, the most important of which can be summarized 
Thus, so here's the phenomenon you see when they subjected the crystal to spectroscopy. They, they see the diffraction patterns that have rotation symmetry of order 10. And here's a Schechtman with a icosahedron that, was, that is to figure into the explanation of what is going on. So there are three different branches that each have interrelated uh, questions uh, to, to address from crystallography. How are the atoms of real quasi crystals actually arranged in three dimensional space from physics? What are the physical properties of substances with long range order but no translation symmetry? And from mathematics, what kinds of order are necessary and sufficient for a pattern of points to have a diffraction pattern with such bright spots as I just showed you? Importantly, the role of the mathematical model would be to function as an explanation of these questions, or for the answers. So interesting, the discovery of quasi crystals prompted the desire for a more inclusive definition of the notion of crystals. And this piece of conceptual development was placed in the hands of a newly formed commission for aperiodic crystals within the union of crystallography. A decision was reached to redefine crystals by the instrumental detection of substances having an essentially discrete diffraction pattern. This obviously opened for mathematical investigations into the possible classes of non periodic structures with such essentially discrete diffraction patterns. Although a methodological framework, a mathematical framework, has been established for char characterizing quasi crystals, and numerous exemplars have been produced in laboratories all, all over the world, many questions remain open concerning the important question of how quasi crystals grow. A recent survey explains that an, a fundamental puzzle in quasi crystal physics is to understand how the growth phase of nucleation and growth can lead to a structure with long range aperiodicity. Ideally, the growth of porcelain crystals, as well as their other physical and chemical properties, should be linked to their mathematical description and mathematical model for explanation. However, this is still a major ongoing research field. So as briefly illustrated in this case, mathematical models, if not mathematics itself, stands to be falsified by empirical evidence. The mathematics that have gone into describing ordinary crystals was, of course, not invalidated by this discovery. Instead, the model was to blame. Yet perhaps because of the entrenched status of the crystallographic paradigm, no alternative was at hand when Schechtman announced his findings. Instead, mathematicians, physicists and crystallographers had to return to the drawing board and the laboratory to come up with new conceptualizations and mathematical models for describing and explaining this newly discovered phenomenon, and that is still going on, that's my point. In doing so, they follow different but overlapping cultures of mathematization, partly shaped by the desire to emulate the successes of the classical paradigm that is, the new conceptualization should be able to answer and explain questions about physical and chemical properties of porcelain crystals. And it should do so based on a model that prescribed the focus on the local rather than the global geometry of, of, of the case. So, thus, I have now exhausted my examples and almost my time, and I want to, to briefly uh, reiterate my main points. So, I have I have presented three examples where mathematics was involved in other branches of science, and I, for my part, would be hard-pressed to say that they are not interdisciplinary collaborations in an extended sense, but I, I invite you to present definitions of interdisciplinarity, in particular focusing on the group level, which would render the examples otherwise. Second, I hope to have shown that different cultures of mathematization were involved in each of these cases, and that the tensions and conflicts can be approached through discussions about the mathematical model as a boundary object. In particular, I've discussed different values of explanation between the different cultures of mathematician. Some of them adhere to standard philosophical conceptions of explanations, the DN model or unification or whatever. Others need perhaps more additional frameworks to be captured as, as interdisciplinary notions in order to broad scope. And in the main example, I hope also to have shown how contemporary science involves important mathematical work that does not reduce to applying mathematics from the shelf. Instead, new conceptualizations and mathematical results are produced through the extended modeling process that involves a feedback. And as such, I hope, as I promised in the abstract, I hope to have at least provisionally revisited the notion of interdisciplinary collaboration as it pertains to mathematics. In short, when mathematics is involved, such collaborations are neither specifically new nor do they strictly follow the epistemic division of labor that is suggested by theoretical accounts of interdisciplinary expertise. Thank you.